worship in the fifth dimension. In the world of physics, the word physics is the Greek word that means natural or nature. In the world of physics, it is determined by physical elements of matter. For everything in the world is constituted or composed by matter. Matter can be identified in one, a solid, two, a liquid, three, a gas. A part of the third one, for my more scientifically minded students, would be something called plasma. It's a part of the third one, the gas. In the world of matter, there is disease. In the world of matter, there is defeat. In the world of matter, there is death. Can you imagine what it would be like if we could get out of the dimension of the physical world of solids, liquids, gas, the plasma part of the gas. There is a fourth element that man must deal with. According to the scripture, in this life, it is appointed unto man. It is appointed unto man wants to die, not to death, just. So now, death is a sign at an appointed time. So the fourth dimension in this world would be time. What would it be like if we could get above Matter, a solid, a liquid, a gas. And what if we could live beyond time? The only way to do that, we would have to somehow make it to the fifth dimension. We couldn't do it. Living in the fourth dimension. When one dares say that that's impossible, because the Bible says time and chance happen at all. How can we escape the fact? that we have to live in time. The book says, every time I say the book says, I, I'm really talking about uh, the Greek and the Latin. It deals with la biblica. It means the book. 
pleblos means many books of the book. So I have a tendency to say the book says. It's the Bible. The Bible says to everything there is a season. The Bible says and a time to everything. Time. To every purpose under the sun. There's our help right there. The Bible tells us that matter only affects, remember, in matter, there is disease, defeat, and death. But the Bible says that matter only affects those who live under the sun. Now the scientist tells me that the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. And the astronomers tell me that the sun is located in the second Mother Hyde was preaching last night and she said, she said, I don't know, but she said there gotta be some Water up there, I right, water down here. Right, right, right. And I was preaching to her, hollering, there he is. Because the scientist says, it's a proven fact. I'm talking about the clouds right now. The scientist says that there is as a sea of water above the clouds. Now, how does she get that with, with the Holy Ghost? But not a PhD, as far as I know. She was right on target. So now we're seeing that if we study astronomy, then, then we know that the sun, our sun and the earth, is a part of the galaxy. The galaxy is located in the heavens of the planets. Paul says, I was caught up to the third heaven. Oh, Bishop! So Paul said that the first heaven is the heaven where the clouds are. And the second heaven yeah, yeah. is the heaven where the stars and the sun is the largest star where the stars are. And time and matter only can control us and kill us if we live under right. the sun. I got it. I got it. Yes, sir. If there would be any way <laughs> that we could take a church and get this church to live above the sun. We would get the church to a place where matter doesn't matter. I'm not talking about attitudinally. I'm not talking about, oh, you're mad at me. Oh, if I die now, who cares? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if we can get you to a place where cancer could come to you but couldn't kill you. Whether or not God took the cancer out of you wouldn't even matter. The doctor could say you still got it. But it wouldn't matter because you're living above it and it can't kill you. Uh, 
something somebody has said, and that sounds like foolishness to me. Well, now, now let's take some of the world's finest minds. The world's finest minds said, there is not only physics, the law of nature, the law where matter matters, the law where there is matter in one solid matter, in two liquids matter, in three gases, and where time prevails, and time appoints death unto all one, two, three, four dimensions. But the smartest mind said, there is not only something called physics, they said there's something called metaphysics. Now, Physics means nature, natural. Meta means above. So metaphysics means above nature. Somebody sitting there said, I didn't want to go to college. I got to get you to go to the college to go to this other place you got to get to. So metaphysics just simply means above nature. Above it. So now, we learn from the wisest man, Solomon in Ecclesiastes, that time and matter only affects people and things under the sun. But if I can get you beyond the sadness of the clouds, and even beyond its so-called silver lining, if I can get you beyond the planetary second heaven, if you hit the third heaven, you'll be in the presence of God. How is that possible? The Bible tells us that when we deal with the book of John, the scripture says here in John, the scripture says here in John that when we deal with that, uh, this is like called a Shamir, this is called a cassock, and the cassock is the working garment of the priest. This is the good looking garment of the <laughs> So I thought we better get rid of the looks and get down to the word. Here you will see. He is 
the maker of the world. And the earth is nothing but his footstool. John says, in the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God. And the Logos was God. So when John started talking like that, he talked during the time of the classical philosophers. He was able to talk the language of Socrates, Thales, Aristotle. And these brothers said, this is our man. We finally got an intellectual man coming. That's what they thought. So John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He used their language. Their language for word, logos, had five meanings from the Greek. They, when they said logos, it wasn't a biblical word. They had never used it in the Old Testament. He picked it up now to deal with a whole nother generation. And I choose that to say, you're going to have to deal with another generation. When we were little, little boys, uh, uh, the preacher would preach. Uh, you were not allowed to play marbles because the preacher said, the book says, marble not. We didn't build a whole lot of things. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, believe that's what the book said, uh, marble not. And so we they said, you're not allowed to play marbles. You're called to a whole nother generation. You're called to a very literate generation. And you just shaking your fist and throwing your leg in the air won't get it in this generation. You will have to have something in your head before you open your mouth. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, John came along, doesn't deal with any of the humanity of Jesus in the first chapter. He deals with the divinity of Jesus. And John says, uh, you uh, college professors who talk about the Logos, you said uh, the Logos is the thought of thought. Uh, and you said that the Logos means reason. Uh, and you said that the Logos means idea. You said that the Logos means concept. And then you said the Logos means word. He said in the beginning was the Logos. And all these professors said, hey man, that's our preacher. We can talk about some God. Logos is God. Thought is God. And he hung right with them. He said, oh yes, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Since his intellectuals were saying amen, he said, and all things were made by the Logos. They said, there it is, we told you. It wasn't like that old crazy church is talking about Jesus is God. Ah, oh, we told you, we agree with this guy. All things were made by him, the Logos. And without him was not anything made that was made in him was a life, and a life was a light of men. And they kept on applauding him. Then he came down there and he said, and this word came unto his own, and his own received him not. He said this same Logos came unto his own, and his own received them not, but as many as received them, to them gave the Logos power to make them sons of God. They said, how is that? He said, because the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. Who is the begotten of the Father? For God so loved the world but have everlasting life. He kept on preaching this thing like you will have to do. You will have to know from the crown of your head to 
the ground under the sole of your feet uh, that Jesus is God. Uh, you have to know it. Uh, you have to, there are going to be times that you're going to get in trouble. Uh, your heart will build out of control. Your child uh, telling you somebody uh, on drugs. Uh, something's gone wrong with your finances. Uh, and you're not going to have time uh, to try to recite what you learned in the catechism. Uh, you are not going to have time uh, to go and address a holy one on the And so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you have to remember that it is here in John that we learn that when we get to chapter 4 in John, Jesus chooses to rendezvous with a Samaritan woman. Who ever heard of such? Now, the Samaritan woman comes out of Babylon. A Samaritan woman comes out of the world. The Samaritan woman comes from being captured. And here, the Assyrians are captured. And ladies and gentlemen, the Samaritan woman comes and here in Samaria, they cohabitate some of them with some of the Jews. They learned in their life that there was a great distinction between the Jews and the Samaritans. Jesus chooses to meet with a Samaritan woman. Aren't you glad that he wanted to move with you? He chose the meeting place. And there he chose it at the well. He always does great object lessons. He chose to meet her at the sixth hour. He chose to meet her at the time of man. He chose to meet her at the well where his father's Jacob, whose name was Israel, had dug a hole but hadn't drunk the water. And he here they had dug wells but never understood the ship that was going to take place. And Jesus shows up and tells the woman there's a ship taking place. I mean, I'm a stolid folk to haul a ship. There's a ship taking place. And so, ladies and gentlemen, he's there and he talks to her. It is here that Jesus introduces the first New Testament subject that he taught in the scriptures. Watch it now. What would be so important to Jesus? He's at the water. Oh, maybe he's going to teach us about baptizing folk. He's at the water. What was the most important subject matter that Jesus taught? Jesus opened his mouth and says, Woman, the kingdom is shifting. He said, The hour coming. And now it is that he said we have shifted and woman you're in this shift he said now I hear you trying to tell me where we should worship God and you're trying to tell me what Jacob and the others said and you're trying to tell me what your folks said he said but woman Listen to me. You said that our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place 
where men ought to worship. There's the subject. The subject matter is worship. Worship. He said that's going to be the key. If you're going to excel in living in this world, in this ship, you got to learn how to worship. And uh, he says to the woman, he says, a woman, uh, they talked about Jerusalem. He said, woman, that was just another dimension. You see, woman, that was a dimension that they started with. Woman, in the first dimension of worship on the earth, Moses' tabernacle was in a place called Gibeon. He said, and that's where they set up to worship. He said, but oh, woman, I'm telling you that we are now going beyond the first dimensions of worship. And we are now moving to places far beyond what you could even imagine. Now, he continues here and he points out to them uh, that God's got a higher place of worship. Yes. Zion is calling you uh, to a higher place. Uh, so when you come to Moses, uh, you would come to Gideon. Uh, when later on you would come uh, to uh, David, uh, you would come to Jerusalem. Uh, but woman, uh, those are lesser dimensions of worship. Uh, I'm here to get you, woman, uh, into the fifth dimension of worship. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, uh, Jesus continues to talk. Notice what he says. You worship, you know not what. Now, you preachers, you will preach the woman at the well one of these days. But don't make a mistake that so many preachers make. They make the mistake of, of trying to explain the what. You know not what you worship. But you see, you have to be a student of the word what. What in the Greek is an article. And the article means, can be translated, what, who, who's, why. So you don't know why, who, what you're worshiping. You have no idea what this is all about. And he said, the reason you don't know is that salvation is not of an academic level. Salvation is of the Jews. He said, they are the ones that understand soteriology. And soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. He said, they understand how to be born again. Now, why did he say this? Well, now you have to understand that when he speaks about the Jews, he then is speaking about those with great command. Now, Jews originally only referred to the sons from Judah. The others were children of Israel. And Judah was a part of the children of Israel, but they were distinctly called Jews because they were of Judah. Everyone had a purpose. When you deal with the 12 tribes, Simeon was called, ladies and gentlemen, to teach a nation. Levi was called to protect and bless a nation. When you deal with Zebulun, he was called to finance the nation. Zebulun worked with ships, and he was called to be the financier of the nation. We don't need everybody in the churches that you pastor taught to teach the little kids in Sunday school. That's important. And we said, well, we're going to make disciples of these kids. That's important. But you need somebody in your church taught how to make money. Ah, there's got to be a Zebulun in the church. 
that is called to make money, who knows how to make money in the body of Christ. Ah, uh, here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, then there was Judah. Ah, uh, now we usually talk about Judah and the praise, and that is correct. Uh, that is a part of his name, uh, Judah the praiser. Uh, but this praiser or worshiper uh, was also he that was called to govern the nation. So praise has a reason. It gets you to govern a world outside of this world where you're able to look at somebody that's sick and say, come let me pray for you because we're about to take you out of this world. We're about to get you lifted to a place where God will handle your case. We're about to cause you to move on higher. I know a lot of people are trying to get money now, and I think that's okay, yeah, but you got to hear this. I can do more with favor than you can do with finance. If you can get God to favor you, God will have somebody give you a hot sign while you're trying to pray for it. I know what I'm talking about. Favor will be greater than finance. Say I'm going for favor. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, when we begin to look at the text, the Bible says the Lord inhabits the praises of Israel. And so Israel are the people who know their God. He said the others don't know who to worship. They're confused on one, two, five, six gods. He said, but Israel knows. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Israel knows that if you want to call him Elion, it's still Jesus. Israel knows if you want to call him El Shaddai, it's still Jesus. Israel knows that if you want to call him Adonai, it's still Jesus. Because, ladies and gentlemen, Israel understands that the monotheism of God actually speaks about mono one theism or means the science of God. The monotheism is the science of one God. We're going to need uh, literate apostolic preachers that can preach this thing uh, called Jesus. Uh, oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, by whatever you want to call it, uh, somebody called it a door. Uh, and it is great, I am not against it, uh, it is great for you to develop your messages uh, and go down the line uh, uh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Tiskanu, and Jehovah Shalem uh, and it's wonderful to do that but when you finish your message with those seven Jehovahistic titles uh, would you please understand you left the others out uh, there are more than 72 Jehovahistic titles uh, if you're going to preach it let's go Hallelujah to God. And so, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, then when you deal with Jehovah, where does he go when you come out of Isaiah? Because he's not called Jehovah any longer. When you leave Isaiah, you've got to follow his name and follow the character. He's sort of like a, a guy that in the copy room of the magazine who is called Clark Kent. But when he goes to the telephone booth, you have to call him Superman. You have to know, ladies and gentlemen, how he switches, not who he is. I heard the pastor today giving such a glorious introduction of his wife 
and he said she wears many hats and he went down explaining all those hats to us and I sat in my seat I said thank God she has many hats but one head hallelujah to God you can put as many hats on that him as you want but there's one God head only one and ladies and gentlemen one day he wears the hat of a shepherd and another day he wears the hat of a sheep one day he wears the hat of a baby and the next day he wears the hat of God one day he wears the hat of a creature and the next day he wears the hat of a creator listen Jesus can become anything he wants to be while never ceasing to be who he is Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, and so now we see that God is saying it's time to move the worship. He said to do it, you've got to go to Israel because the Israel understands worship. To understand worship, you have to understand the object of your worship. You have to understand why you are worshiping him. May I tell you, there is a simplicity and a complexity with worship. Worship, ladies and gentlemen, can never be based upon one's ability and one's creativity alone. Now, a worship, ladies and gentlemen, can never be initiated by an outside force. Worship can't, you can't go off and worship because the organ is hit a key. You can't go off and worship because somebody gave you a peanut butter sandwich. No, no, not worship. Worship cannot be initiated from an outside force. Worship's got to be initiated from an inside. You have to grow to a place that if God doesn't give you another slice of bread, I will worship him because he's gone. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, and so it is to Israel that God says, I want you to be guardians of the Ark of the Covenant. And I want you to carry me and to transport me from one realm to another. Brothers and sisters, I want to caution us. I have taught you the difference between praise and worship. But I, I, I hear sometimes, I said, I, 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 I'm not blaming anybody else, but I hear a danger in that. You cannot minimize praise to try to teach worship. Because no praise, no worship. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the word praise that comes from the scripture comes, uh, it is where we get our word of praise. The word praise is to set a price or a value on an object. The word praise means to evaluate and to express admiration for that which we have appraised. You can't praise God without making an appraisal. You've got to appraise him and say he alone is God. There's no praise in Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, nothing. Appraise him. Open your mouth when you are talking about God and learn to say there's none like him. He's God by himself. He is the Almighty One. He is the Lord God Almighty. Brothers and sisters, when you deal with worship, you've got to now get to the worth of a hymn. Because the worship comes from worship. When you worship him, it is like a man and a woman who 
dig into a treasury and they are getting all the gold and the silver and they're throwing it on the one ship. So when you join in the worship him, I say he's a mighty God and you say he's a good God and she said none like him and we just keep on keeping work on the ship until we got a ship that is worthy of our praise. That's how you do it. And so ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the word worship, if I can give you synonyms for the word that you can understand, it means to praise. The word worship from the Hebrew and the Greek means authentic. It's the real thing. The word worship means worth. The word worship means value. The word worship requires revelation. And the word worship is admiration. It is out of your praise that you will birth the thing you're praying for. It is out of your praise that you will fuel your ship to get out of this world. It is out of your praise that God himself will be revealed to you. God must receive our praise and our praise must be potent and focused. You got to know who you worship. Ladies and gentlemen, our praise has got to be continuous. You don't break the praise. You have to continue to praise Him. You do not praise God out of your leisure. You praise God out of your labor. I worship you. I stand back and call on your name. I declare there is no God like our God. And so, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, when you God then sets you in order to go. Now we must make a move. We've got to get beyond the four dimensions. We've got to get beyond those dimensions of matter. Solid case against you. Liquid movements against you. Ah, we got to get things that appear out of nowhere against you in a gaseous substance. We got to appear out of running out of time against you. And we got to get you into the fifth dimension of worship. It is here, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus shows up at Samaria. And Jesus says, Lady, you've been in the middle. You see, during Jesus' time, uh, uh, Israel uh, was divided into three areas. There was Judea in the south, uh, there was Galilee in the north, and Samaria in the middle. Uh, when you read the text uh, in John 3, uh, Jesus is departing from uh, Judea and passing through Samaria on his way to Galilee where he's about to set up his headquarters. So you've got to catch him while he's passing through. Catch him right now, catch him while he's passing through. And so ladies and gentlemen, he begins to tell them what he has in mind and how he wants to be worshipped. When you worship him in the fifth dimension, you've got to understand everything is set up by God in seven days. And seven is the one week of God. Pentecost deals with, ladies and gentlemen, seven sevens. Each of those have seven days. Seven days times seven is 49 days. So that's seven weeks. The Lord says on the first day of the eighth week, call it Pentecost, something is new. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, hear me now about Pentecost. Listen carefully. Jesus is identified seven feasts of Jehovah. And those seven feasts all deal with time and the first through the seven days of the week. The first feast is called the Passover. It was on the first day that Jesus divided the light from the darkness. It was his performance to bring the people out of Egypt. It was the second feast that was called the Unleavened Bread. It was where Jesus said, what I'm about to do is going to happen suddenly. And he said, you will have no time to wait on the bread to rise. When you have yeast in the bread, you got to wait on it to rise. Jesus said, what I'm going to do, don't put no yeast in this. We're not talking about sin right now. He, we're talking about time. God said, I'm going to take you out of time. Don't wait on bread to rise. Get unleavened bread. Then he said to us, the third feast would be called the first fruit. That's the day that God created vegetation in the earth. And the Bible said it was his purpose or his performance to show praise before God. Then the fourth day, or the fourth dimension, the fourth day, ladies and gentlemen, was the day he created the, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And he called that feast Pentecost. And he said that you are the lights of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So now the fourth dimension is Pentecost. It is in the fourth dimension of worship that you get anointing. And when you get anointing, uh, I have my preachers, uh, uh, when they try to introduce me sometimes, uh, they say, bless Bishop Wagner, Lord, he's coming to preach to us, uh, and they pray, Lord, uh, send the anointing uh, that will make preaching easy. Uh, that's a beautiful prayer uh, for the fourth dimension. Uh, but we are headed for the fifth dimension. Uh, the fifth dimension is beyond anointing. It's called glory. If you get to the fifth dimension, you don't need the anointing that makes preaching easy. You get the glory where you won't have to preach at all. It is a whole nother level. If you get to the fifth dimension, you will not need to get in prayer lines. All you will need is to have the saint that is next to you. Say, Jesus, and you will be delivered. And so, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I've been working to get you to the fifth dimension. The fifth dimension is called the Feast of the Trumpets. And it is where God said, let the creatures that have life, let them come on up out of the ground. Look now, he didn't say, and he shaped the well. He said life was already in the ground. It was dead asleep, and all he had to do was just say, come. And they were able to get up and come. Is there anybody here that believes it's your time for a miracle? And it's your time for you now to begin to move to the fifth dimension. The fifth dimension is the sound of the trumpet. Let me hear a trumpet over there. This is the fifth dimension. That's what I'm talking about. It's the sound of the trumpet. Let me hear the trumpet again. It's the sound of the trumpet. Let me hear the trumpet go. Where God is saying there's something down inside of you that's got to come alive. There's something inside of you that oh God of praise. I need you to wrap back and just say, Jesus. Hallelujah. And find out that, that you're moving to the fifth dimension of worship. In the fifth dimension, you look for God. You don't look for healing. You look for 
pays all praise and a pays all praise means to lead the joy. There is a Shabbat praise. Ah, oh, that's the one my grandmother used to have. The Shabbat praise. You can be lifting the offering and one of the old saints would just go. Hallelujah. Wouldn't say anything else. That was it. Go over here. Scare everybody in the church. You can be in a funeral and the casket's coming down the aisle and those saints would go into a Shabbat.
steps he had to get up because the call is greater than your circumstance whatever your circumstance is your call is greater tell somebody you can't die but the Lord is calling you tell somebody I refuse to let you die get a hold of them and tell them by the power Thing is real. Look at your hands and say true. 